This is the Greg Bedard Patriots Podcast. It's time to talk draft. He's Greg. I'm Nick. This episode of the Greg Bedard Patriots Podcast with Nick Cattles is brought to you by FanDuel, the exclusive wagering partner of the CLNS Media Network. Sign up now at FanDuel.com slash Boston and claim your $200 bonus. Also, indeed, in Indeed.com slash Bedard. Don't spend hours on multiple job sites looking for candidates with the right skills when you can do it all with Indeed. Well, Greg, the Patriots were very, very busy during draft weekend. I don't know how many of us expected or anticipated them drafting 12 guys, but that's exactly what they did. They drafted 12 dudes. Uh, the only move up was uh, up the board for kicker Chad Ryland, which we'll get into, but let's go pick by pick. Starting with uh, Christian Gonzalez, 17th overall, they moved down from 14 to 17, and they picked the Oregon cornerback. Yeah, we t- we talked about uh, that pick a lot last week. Um, you know, I I really like the pick. I mean, you know, as long as the Patriots are, you know, correct, sort of in their uh, their pre draft analysis of a lot of the stuff we talked about with Gonzalez. I mean, it's look the physical skills in the film are there. Um, he's, he has anything you see there, what you can see, he has the potential to be a number one lockdown cornerback. Um, but a lot, you know, a lot of things with those guys. I mean, for example, look at Jeff Akuda with the lions who Matt Patricia drafted, I think third overall, um, who just washed out with that team. Um, it's about the internal makeup and, you know, I know that there are teams that question whether he has. Um, you know, whatever, the mental toughness, the attitude, the alpha stuff, like, does he have enough of that stuff to be that player? Um, obviously the Patriots think he, he, he does. And I'm, you know, I'm not going to second guess that. I mean, I think given what we know, the weaknesses on the team, I think that that was definitely worth whatever roll the dice that they did. Yeah, I thought it was a home run pick. Uh, you know, you don't know how any of these guys are going to work out. We could say that for a lot of different players. We've had players that are seen that that have seemed to be safe picks and they end up not being good picks. We have, you know, picks that might be uh, flyers that end up working out. You, you really don't know the draft, as they say. It's cliche, but it's true. It's an inexact science. I do like the idea that they have Adrian Clem on this staff, a guy who should have some inside information on Gonzalez and, and what makes him tick. So I thought it was a home run pick from what we know. Round two. Now, we thought the Patriots might move up in round two to start day two, but they did not. They they decided to stick and pick at 46, and they drafted a Georgia Tech edge Keon White, Greg. Yeah, this is where things start to get a little bit dicey for me. Um, you know, look, uh, Keon White is a good prospect for them on paper. Um, he checks a lot of the boxes, quote unquote, that they look for. Um, I question. I have questions about whether they should be looking for those things anymore. Um, if 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 that led you to Ty Warren in 2003, should you be looking to this f- for the same thing in 2023? I have questions about that. Um, I think White is fine. I think he'll play in the league a long time. I think he's a good player. I just don't like how in the second round you're getting a guy who's not really an edge player. Um, he's not really an internal guy. He's a swing guy, and given what the Patriots have on their roster and how they view certain people, like basically Keon White's a Dietrich Wise replacement. If you could tell me today that Keon White has the ability or the chance to come in and displace Dietrich Wise and be the starter within the next year, year and a half, then I'd be like, okay, I'm on board because I've been I've been trying to upgrade that spot forever. I just have my doubts whether that's going to happen. So now we get into, you know, how long. I think a lot of these, a lot of these picks from here on out, are backup replacement, way down the line stuff. Where where I think they should be, they should have been swinging a little bit more. It all depends on how they see him. Um, you know, he, he has athleticism, he has power. He he is, as you said, like if you were going to build a Madden player. And his frame and all of that, Keon White fits the description. He he was a tight end, started at Old Dominion, and then moved on to Georgia Tech. He's an older guy who they who they drafted, which was another theme in this draft. They they tend to draft guys that are a little bit older. 
Um, so, you know, how much potential? That's the question. I mean, the, the guy has been a full-time defensive player for like a season. So how much potential is there? Seems to be a lot. Does he reach that? None of us know. But, uh, you know, I, I thought that theoretically, Greg, this pick is a good pick. Theoretically. And, and will it work out? Again, I, I hate to sound like I'm sitting on the fence. We just don't know. If you tell me this is a guy that can play the edge a little bit, he can move inside and get some bull rush for you. You can move him along the defensive line. Um, you know, he's he brings that athleticism. Then it's a it's a it's a fine pick by me. Yeah, but that's but that's Dietrich Wise. I mean, that's that's what Dietrich Wise does, and he's one of Belichick's favorite players. Like, and and you know, I I just don't understand the point of the pick in that he's he he's not going to play anytime soon. Like, if you told me he like Dietrich Wise's job is in danger, like you know, Bill Belichick wants to put you know Mac Jones's job in danger, like you know, okay. But like right now, I mean, like, let's just take the team for this year in sub and, and you know, his best chances to get on the field in sub, you know, it's Uche, it's Judon on the edge. It's Dietrich Wise inside. And it's Christian Barmore. Like who's coming off the field to get key on white snaps. I just have a hard time seeing it. So that's why I like, I think it's a luxury pick. It's a lot of these picks are if the Patriots are in the AFC championship, uh, game every year and they're fighting just to get into the playoffs now all right well if we're gonna go big picture let's go big picture here's the thing here's what i think okay i think the patriots did not love the wide receivers in this draft i think the patriots did not love the offensive tackles in this draft and if you listen to all the draft pundits and analysts whatever the hell they're worth it was a very thin offensive tackle class once you got to broderick jones that was pretty much it as far as guys who could really plug in play. So the Patriots didn't like Broderick Jones because he had some issues off the field. They weren't going to draft him. All the other tackles were off the board. They weren't going to move up. Obviously they had a cluster of players, whatever that is. Okay. When you look at wide receiver, again, people would tell you, unless you were going to draft a guy somewhere in the twenties, this class was pretty thin. I don't have an issue with the lotto picks. They took about tight end. Okay, tight end. There was a whole run at the top of the second round that they missed out on and said they sat and took Keon White. That that would be one of my big criticisms. And I do think you got to you got to identify a couple tackles. They weren't all they weren't all bad in this draft. I mean, like Carter Warren is a guy later who they passed on in sort of like their fourth round, third round type of thing like that. The big criticism would be, you know, I, I I like a lot of their picks, okay? But I think they were like really safe where they should have they should have been able to identify a tackle and a tight end at least. And you throw that in the mix with Christian Gonzalez, you get a tackle, say trade up, identify somebody in the third round. Dewan Jones was out there. There's some medical questions about him. You trade up anywhere in the second round and get a tight end. And then then you do you do Christian Gonzalez, a tight end, you you get Keon White. You get Mapu or whatever, and then you get a developmental tackle. That's a knocked out of the park draft in terms of my mind. This was the Patriots playing it safe when we've seen them be aggressive for, you know, especially defensive people um, in the past. Okay, so again, we're off the rails with the plan. I'm throwing the plan out because now we're, we're, we're knee deep into this. Okay, we're just going to roll with this. If you see City Sal, and I know how you feel about Sal, you don't believe he's a tackle. You believe he's a backup tackle at best. I saw you tweet about it. I get it. But it doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what I think. It's the guys that are in the room drafting, okay? If they believe City Sal is a developmental tackle, then that's what they got. I don't have much of an issue of drafting a developmental tackle if you don't like the tackle class. Matthew Bergeron's tape, I heard many people say this, was not very impressive. Dewan Jones, you brought him up. There's a reason why he fell to the fourth round. The guy's full of red flags from what I read. So again, if City Sal works as a developmental tackle, how much did you lose? If you drafted three interior offensive linemen like I thought they did on Saturday, and City Sal ended up not being able capable of, if he's not capable of playing tackle, and they're totally wrong on the player, and Adrian Clem can't help him out, then you look back and you absolutely say, yeah, well, that was a big miss. The tight end point, I agree with your tight end point. But the one one of the things that, to me, there were a couple of things about this draft I didn't like, and one of them was not taking a tight end. This was a very deep tight end class. It was perfectly set up for them to find a guy who's young that they could work with, develop, and go into next year. And we'll get into this. There are major questions about this roster next season. I know people don't want to listen to it, 
because we're focused on this year. But when you look at offensive tackle, you look at tight end, and you could also look at wide receiver, we've got legitimate questions about those positions now. So I, I totally agree with you on that. However, if you look at this, Greg, and one of your criticisms, and I'm going to push back here because one of your criticisms is that this team hasn't drafted for the future. They haven't set themselves up to replace guys on the roster, right? And yes, mm -hmm. they didn't do so much at tight end. And I agree with that. The issue is they had a lot of holes for the future. We've talked about that. The 2024 offseason, they've got a bunch of guys coming off the books. So they had a bunch of positions to look at. So if you tell me they got Christian Gonzalez, who's a bona fide cornerback one, if all things go well, okay. They got Keon White, which again, it, it depends on their evaluation of the player. You don't think he can play edge. I've heard other people say he can't play edge. There are other people that have looked at him and said, well, he's young. He's going to develop. He's got athleticism. You could play him in the edge in Belichick's system. If you believe that, then you've got Judon getting older and his contract coming up soon. You've got Uche, who's going to be an unrestricted free agent, who I think is going to make a lot of money in the offseason. So they're looking at it and saying, we need somebody to replace those guys. So uh, if we're going to sit there and we're going to bitch about them not being ready for certain positions, and then they draft guys who are theoretically going to replace those positions down the road, you can say the same thing about Mafi replacing Owenu if, if, if Owenu is, is not going to sign in New England. You need somebody who's good enough to back him up and be ready and plug him in at right guard. So Mafi's that guy. To me, it's City Sal. If City Sal works as a tackle, then the draft makes a little bit more sense to me. It makes actually much more sense to me. If Sal doesn't work as a tackle, then you drafted three interior offensive linemen and moved up for a kicker, and you're going to regret that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I I, I largely agree with that, and I don't I don't have I, I don't have a problem. Um, and, and actually, you know, like we've talked about, I'm, I'm very much in favor of like, let's get succession plans, op uh, uh, you know, started. Um, my bigger problem has been they've whiffed on succession plans at big places. Like yes. it, it, the offensive line is like one of the, like, you should be able to bring a guy in and like, they take these guys, you know, fourth, fifth, sixth round. Okay. I mean, you know, look at a winning six round pick, you know, that, like that's the ideal thing. But like, you know, we're staring at a roster where they're losing two wide receivers. And granted, I told you, I hated the wide receiver draft. And like, I don't, I don't mind what they did at receiver, but like, you know, you got two tight ends going in the final year of their deal. Um, you know, you, you have, uh, it's slipping my mind right now, but you know, you have other things that are like a little bit pricier where you need to replace people. And like, defensive line which was probably one of the strongest units that they had on the team last year nobody's really going anywhere um you know anytime soon i have a hard time seeing judon going anywhere uche will but i don't i don't think this is that the 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 key on white pick was for that sort of thing i just think that um you know they're starting succession plans at you know places where you can do it a lot of different ways whereas you know the price here the offensive tackle is the offensive tackle and tight end are the two big ones that are glaring red needs a year from now, at least at, yep. at, at the latest. And they didn't do anything there. And I just thought, you know, if they would have done that and then done a lot of the other things, I would have said this, this draft was awesome, but they just sort of Bill just sort of chose to sit back and let the draft come to him. And he only moved up for a kicker. It's it's, that's a little bit tougher for me. Yeah, I mean, again, I think it all depends on how you viewed this draft. If if Belichick and Matt Grow were sitting there going, you know what, we don't love a lot of guys on 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 this board. We we just don't we don't love the tackles. So we think City Sal might have a shot of being a developmental guy we can get in the fourth round. You know what? I'll take a shot on City Sal because I don't believe Dewan Jones has what it takes to be an NFL player. The red flags. Um, I don't see much difference. Again, this is them, not me looking at it saying, okay, well, how much of a difference is there between City Sal and, and this guy or that guy? And th there seemed to be a lot of questions about a lot of the tackles that were past the top four or five. So it, it, it kind of, to me, it makes sense. If you don't believe in those guys and you think that City Sal might be the de developmental tackle, then you pull the trigger on the guy that you feel comfortable with and you say, let's see if Adrian Clem can coach him up. I mean, I think one of the things, Greg, that's rather obvious coming from this draft, and we'll get back to pick by pick in a second, but the Patriots believe in their coaching staff. And that was a huge miss last year. But they are putting a lot on the plate of Adrian Clem, and they're putting a lot on the plate of Bill O'Brien, and they're saying, 
here's what you have. Adrian Clem, you're going to have Trent Brown. You got to get him week in and week out. And you got to make sure that that guy is working his tail off and he's playing at the tippity top of, of his potential. You got Riley Reef. People think he's done. Can you get us one good year out of Riley Reef at, at right tackle? And if not, can, can you make something out of the, you know, Reef, Anderson, McDermott, could just Sal Stuber, Jambalaya that you have at right tackle? Can you get Cole Strange to play like a legit first round guard? Like that's a lot mm-hmm. on Adrian Clem. And for for Bill O'Brien, it's look, we we had heard, Greg, that and I'm sure you've heard many of the th- same things and said the same things on this podcast plenty of times. They don't necessarily feel like their wide receiver group is in any trouble. Now, contractually, they got a lot of guys coming up after this year, and that's a question they're going to have to answer. But as far as right now, I think they looked at this wide receiver class and said, again, not super impressed. We'll take a couple of late lotto picks on guys that might be able to bust out on potential that could be a fit for us. We're going to be fine for this year with what we have. We got Bill O'Brien coming in and, you know, Tyquan Thornton's going to have to step up. We, we invested, we moved up to draft that guy. We believe that guy is going to, to be a star for us. And now it's up to him and Bill O'Brien and Mac Jones to make that thing work. So I, I just think they, they didn't necessarily love the players at the positions that, that they needed um, according to us. And so that kind of left them in free agency. They went out and got Anderson and reef at tackle because they didn't love the tackle class. So they went out there and signed a couple of guys. Now, they didn't pay a ton of money for them. They obviously didn't want to go to the top of the free agency class at tackle, which is another decision you can second guess. But to me, they they just weren't in love with a lot of guys in this draft. So they they drafted dudes that they thought were athletic, projected to be possible studs, uh, and 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 guys that they really liked, whether it was a position that they needed right now or not. They said these are the guys on our board, and we're not going to reach for other dudes that we just don't like. That that's that's my read on on the draft overall. All right, so round three, this got a lot of people talking. Uh, Marte Mapu from Sac State. Yeah, let's tell the people about that as soon as I tell them about FanDuel. Make a fast break to FanDuel during the NBA playoffs because right now new customers can get a no sweat first bet up to one thousand dollars. That's one thousand dollars back in bonus bets if you if your first bet doesn't win. I love FanDuel. I'm on it all the time. My Jack Campbell linebacker Patriots draft uh, pick did not come in, but oh well. There's no better place all uh, to get in on all the playoff action than America's number one sports book. Visit FanDuel.com slash Boston and get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's FanDuel.com slash Boston. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. Okay, so uh, Marte Mapu. Um, You know, he was on my list. I like him. He's intriguing. Um, You know, another guy sort of like Keon White that you're like, all right, well, what is he? Um, Is he a... Is he more of a safety? Is he more of a linebacker? If he puts on weight, can he do that? Um, definitely intriguing to me. So i i like the I like the player. I like it's a you know sort of like a future bet. Now it'll make some people uneasy because there have been at least the Patriots didn't take this guy in the second round, which they've done in past years. They've taken this taken sort of a swing, whether it's you know Ju- Juwan Williams or Ross I Dowling or like just some some guys with. That you're not really sure what they're gonna be, and uh, look, I, you know, I think that I think that he's a linebacker long term, um, you know, but uh, you know, we'll have to see. I think he's got a chance to, you know, possibly be an impact guy, but I think that's, you know, that's a ways down the road. Coming from Sacramento State, um, you know, we need Nick to go out there and go scout him. Um, go into the film room and, and watch all his film and report back to us. Uh, but, you know, I, I I think it's a ways down the road. He's a project, a little early for a project, but I don't have a huge problem, you know, with the pick and the player itself. I, I, I'm intrigued by him. You know, I've been screaming from the mountaintop, and you have as well, to add legit athleticism and speed to this defense. And I think the Patriots have actually done a pretty damn good job of that the last couple of years. And this continued that like, again, all of this is theoretical. All of this is hypothetical, but it, Keon white, damn good athlete. Mapu, damn good athlete. Christian Gonzalez, damn good athlete. All those guys, you know, ha- have some speed at their positions. 
White doesn't play as fast as you hoped he would. Maybe he'll figure that out. But they added athleticism and speed to this defense. The question I have about Mapu is, you know, he's like 220 pounds. Now, to me, I think he's the perfect kind of guy, Greg, that you and I have discussed. The the mm-hmm. outside linebacker, fly around the field, make plays. Daniel Jeremiah, who I respect the hell out of, you know, he tweeted out that Mapu is, you know, his favorite player in this draft. He, he thinks he could be the, the best playmaker in this draft. Will Bill actually play him at linebacker? I don't know. Will, will he will he live with that, the, the 225-pound guy, or is he going to still roll out the, the Jawan Bentleys and the Tavais of the world? Right. That's something I don't know. You know, if Gerard Mayo takes over and he's like, yeah, we got to get Mapu's playmaking and speed on the field, let's do this, then, you know, then we're talking about somebody else. So it, I'm, I'm just interested to see how they handle Mapu. W- w- will they, you know, he could be just strictly a special teams guy this year. And yep. according to reports, you know, they did try to trade out of this spot. They liked Mapu. Um, you know, the, the feeling I got from what I read and what I've heard is they, 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 they love Mapu and, and Bill especially loves Mapu. But I, I don't think they believed that they needed to draft him where they got him at 76. I think they tried to trade down. Nothing worked. And they said, let's just pick the guy we love. And that's, that's where they settled. All right, let's, uh, let's group together the offensive linemen since we, we hit Sal a little bit and we hit Mafia a little bit, but Jake Andrews goes in, in round four at one Oh seven. He is a center from Troy. We've got uh city Sal who we discussed, who's a guard who they reportedly, according to our friend, Burt Breer will try at tackle uh, he was picked in round four as well at 117. And then they came back at round five and drafted Antonio Maffi, who people seem to be much higher on than the other two guys. But they, they end up with Andrew, Sal, and Maffi. Just kind of your thoughts, Greg, about the interior offensive line and especially Sal, if he's if he's a tackle, if you think he has any chance of being a tackle. Yeah, I, I, I like the film on Jake Andrews. Um, I think he's definitely... Um, a center first with some, you know, guard versatility. Um, you know, he, it's a little puzzling to me because I thought they liked Cody Rusi, who was an undrafted free agent who made the team and was on the team the whole time as sort of uh, the next center. So it, that, that makes us pick a little bit puzzling, but, you know, I've been asking for a, you know, a developmental center for a while. And I, you know, he looks good on paper. Like, you know, I'm fine with that. I, you know, uh, part of this this discussion on this pick should be, you know, I heard from teams that the Patriots were looking to move up in the fourth round. Um, you know, they, uh, let's see, Blake Freeland, the Colts took the developmental tackle like right in front of their Andrews pick. Yep. Um, you know, Keely Ringo went to the uh, cornerback from Georgia who was on a lot of lists, went right there. The Raiders and McDaniels took, you know, there was a whole run on, you know, Sal DeVere, the top pick in the fourth round as a guard sort of tackle guy. So, you know, where could they have been trading up? Again, they had like three fourth round picks that they used. Um, you know, even before, who was it? Uh, the Ryland pick at kicker, Dewan Jones, the tackle who we talked about, went. Uh, so you wonder what sort of went on in that round. Like, you know, were they going to take Freeland and then Andrews, but then the Colts took him? And then they just were like, well, let's just draft the best guy on our board, who's Andrews. Um, you know, I, I don't mind the picks. I think Andrews has a chance to replace David Andrews down the road. He has two years left on his contract. I think Sal, to me, when I watch his film, and I haven't watched a ton of it, to me, he looks a lot like Cam Fleming, which doesn't really excite me. You know, I think he's a, a, he's a, he's a cross between Fleming and Awenu. And I do think he's more of a guard. I think I, I think tackle is a reach on Sal. I think uh, Mafi uh, is definitely a guard and definitely has a chance to be a good player. I liked um, some of his film. He moves really well. He pulls really well. So you know, in a vacuum, you know, I like the guys that they got. You know, for down the road and you know a, a, a position group that I didn't think needed a lot of attention and got three picks all of a sudden in a row. I agree with a lot of what you said to me. Again, we, we hit this a little bit earlier, a lot rides on South. Like if you tell me this, this offensive tackle attempt, quote unquote works out and he's somebody who could be molded into a, a pretty good tackle. 
then you look back and it makes all the sense in the world because Jake Andrews, as you said, is the backup of David Andrews. Uh, David's had a couple of concussion issues. He's in his 30s now. His contract's coming up in a couple of years. Uh, Mafia, I think, is on with new you know, insurance. I think you know when you look at that contract situation, um, if he prices himself out, then the Patriots are, are are looking for somebody who they might be able to plug and play. And maybe with a, a year under his belt, Mafia is that guy at right guard. So that, that makes sense. It, it really is about City Sal. If Sal ends up being an, a guard, then you look back and, and to me, um, you know, spending three picks on interior offensive linemen when you had some other needs, that's that's a miss. So it's really going to rely on Sal. Uh, all right, let's get to the kicker now. Chad Ryland. The Patriots moved up. They moved up in round four and selected with the 10th pick in that round, 112th overall, Chad Ryland, Greg. Yeah, I, you know, the kickers, whatever, sort of the way I deal with them during the special teams during the season. Like, I, you know, I trust those guys on that. What I can tell you is I'm not giving them bonus points for – if, if they get a decent kicker and punter because they were only in this position because they screwed up on Roar Wasser and whatever happened with Jake Bailey. I mean, they, they these are self-inflicted wounds that they are that they are correcting. And I can tell you one thing, Nick, though, and I heard this. Phil Perry, I heard him on his podcast say that there are people, I think, on the team who think like it's not out of the possibility that Nick Folk and Ryland are both on the roster this year. If they, so that Folk would handle um, field goals and Ryland would handle kickoffs. If that happens and you trade it up in the fourth round after you know using a fifth on Roarwasser a couple years ago, I'm going to lose my freaking mind. Like Ryland, if he better be their their opening day kicker, and he better be good because I'm getting sick of this crap with the special teams and the kickers and the punters. Like freaking get it right. I thought this is Bill's wheelhouse, and in case and, and now we're just like throwing crap up against the wall. So Ryland better kick for them. If he does, fine. I won't mention him again. Very unpredictable position to draft. Moving up in the fourth round to draft one, you better hit on him. And I agree with you. If if <laughs> not, if Ryland is not kicking off and kicking field goals for this team, I'm going to move some furniture in a very hasty way in my house because that that would be re gosh damn ridiculous that you moved up in the fourth round to get a guy who's going to do kickoffs for you. Outrageous! Out out freaking rageous! It, it would. <laughs> I don't even want to think about it. <laughs> Let's get to uh, let's group some guys together again. Uh, round six. Again, I, I don't think that the Patriots were high on the wide receiver class. It's rather obvious. They decided to take some swings. And for me, I absolutely loved and it's relatively speaking. It's the sixth round. Both of these guys might not make the team, but I, I loved the philosophy and I loved the players they brought in. Kayshawn Boutte, who is a wide receiver at LSU. You've heard a lot about him, I'm sure, as, as you Patriots fans have scoured through podcasts. He was projected as a first-round pick if you go back 12 months ago. Um, he had some big-time numbers early on in his LSU career. Uh, did not necessarily get along with Brian Kelly early on, which is not a shocker. Um, I'm not saying it's Brian Kelly's fault, but as we know, Brian Kelly has been known to rub some players the wrong way. He's not the easiest guy to play for. So there was a little bit of friction there. Butte also had some injury issues, but potentially this guy, again, if he takes his job seriously and he says to himself, man, I fell to the sixth round, I have to get my ass in gear. I think the Patriots could have found a, a diamond in round six. And then Demario Douglas, uh, Greg, I know he's a guy that I, I believe that you liked. Um, he was picked at 210 overall, another wide receiver out of Liberty, my old stomping grounds in Virginia. And uh, he's kind of a water bug, as they say. He's he's a slot receiver, super quick, and actually played pretty well. People will say, oh, Liberty, you know, level of competition. He played pretty well when the level of competition also stepped up. He stepped up. So I, I actually, again, relatively speaking, I love the Butte and Douglas picks. Yeah, I mean, considering um, where they drafted Butte, uh, you know, I'm fine with the pick. Um, you know, he is a guy who, you know, in a lot of ways, you look at it and you're just like, okay, he's got a chance to hit. I mean, it's a, it's a lottery ticket and, uh, you know, I'm fine with that. You know, I just want people to know that there are, uh, there, and I'm not going to get into it cause I don't really care. And they drafted him in the sixth round. I mean, it'd be different if they put, you know, resources into him. 
but there are a lot of red flags on this yeah. guy. I would say that probably the majority of the NFL didn't want to touch this guy with a 10 foot pole. Now, I, I, I don't think he's um, a danger or anything like that. I just think people in the league just think that he has no chance to get us head on straight and, you know, whatever. And we've seen guys like this all the time. It's, you know, reminds me of a, some picks and some signings that the Dolphins used to make back in the day when I picked them. But, you know, you take a swing and you hope that Troy Brown or somebody in the building can, you know, uh, keep him out of trouble and um, focused on what he's doing. And definitely he's got a chance to be um, – he, he he has an op- the, this young man has an opportunity to be a really good football player in this league. We'll see whether he takes advantage of it. Um, you know, uh, Douglas, I love the pick. Um, yeah, how long have I been asking for you know a jitterbug, water bug type of guy? Um, it, this is this guy. You know, he's a little slight, which is why you got him uh, so late. But I love him. He's got the stop stop start ability. Um, jump cuts, like all that stuff. Like I'm looking forward to watching him um, on the field. I think he's got, uh, you know, a decent chance to make this team. Um, one side note to this, I'm a little bit, probably a little bit disappointed because considering the Christian Gonzalez pick and the dominoes that we think are going to go down at cornerback with Jonathan Jones re-signed, I mean, ideally it should be Gonzalez, Jack Jones, and Jonathan Jones as your top cornerback. And I was kind of getting a little excited for Marcus Jones to move more full-time to offense, which still could happen when it comes to the roster crunch and numbers and things like that. But uh, to me, Demario Douglas would be more of a offensive player and take Marcus Jones away from offense. They're that same type of player. And then, you know, the last couple picks, Amir Speed and Isaiah Bolden, you know, tradey guys, big guys, cornerbacks, special teams sort of guys. You know, again, lottery tickets that, you know, if one pays off, like, you know, that's a good pick. But at least they're with all these guys in the sixth and seventh round, at least they're they're taking they're taking risks on guys with athletic upside who are tradey, who have a chance to be difference makers, you know, if the lottery ticket hits. Where in the years past they just used to take like we well, yeah, all right, let me take a you know, let me take a special teams like a long snapper or up guy or something like that. We were just like, this guy has no chance. At least these guys have some semblance of a chance to maybe be a player at some point. I agree with you. Uh, before we get to you and Belichick, because we got a couple more things to hit quickly, let's tell the fine people about Indeed. If you're a business owner that likes to jump to the news highlights, you'll love Indeed. With Indeed, you'll connect with quality candidates whose resumes on Indeed match your job description. When you need to hire, you need Indeed. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Don't spend hours on multiple job sites looking for candidates with the right skills when you can do it all with Indeed. Find top fa- talent fast with Indeed's suite of powerful hiring tools like matching assessments and virtual interviews. Hate waiting. Indeed's U.S. data shows over 80% of Indeed employers find quality candidates whose resume on Indeed matches their job description the moment they sponsor a job. I love it. I look through there. We've been looking for people over at BSJ. I love how quick it is. I can dial things down and boom, it's right there. Candidates you invite to apply through Indeed match are three times more likely to apply to your job than candidates who only see it in a search, according to U.S. Indeed data. With Indeed, matching as soon as you sponsor a post, you get a short list of quality candidates whose resumes on Indeed match your job description. Boom! It's hiring at warp speed. Indeed does the hard hiring work for you, sponsor a job, and will match you with quality candidates whose resumes on Indeed who on Indeed fit your job description right when you post. With Indeed, you can start hiring fast. Join over 3 million businesses worldwide using Indeed to hire great talent fast. Indeed knows when you're growing your own business, you have to make every dollar count. That's why with Indeed, you only pay for quality applications that match your must-have job requirements. Visit Indeed.com slash Bedard to start hiring now. Just go to Indeed.com slash Bedard. Terms and conditions apply. Cost per application pricing not available for everyone. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Indeed Indeed.com. And I'll tell you. I was uh, lying down, getting ready to go to bed, and I threw on uh, Bill Belichick's post <laughs> press conference. And I'm I'm listening to Bill just do usual Bill through the whole presser, not giving anybody anything. 
Then I heard my guy, Greg, then my guy, Greg popped on and he pressed and pressed and pressed Belichick on Mac Jones. And Greg, I'm going to tell you, I give you a lot of credit because being in the media, I, I watched this and I felt a twinge of, of being uncomfortable, but you did what needed to be done. And you, you, you know, you kept pressing Belichick on Mac Jones, whether or not he's his guy. And you went back to what Belichick had said before the season last summer about Mac. And do you feel the same way about him? And, and is, is he your guy? Is, is he your quarterback? I, I, I thought it was, uh, I thought it was really good work by you. I thought it was a great line of questioning. I thought you, you somewhat cornered Bill into, into, uh, saying stuff that he doesn't necessarily want to say. And, and Belichick for the first time in a while actually mentioned Mac by name. And he said that absolutely he feels the same way about Mac that he felt last summer. Uh, just your thoughts being in that moment and Bill's reaction. Yeah, I just, um, uh, some real quick background. So the, the, the Patriots have been screwing around with us, um, in the media for, um, well, I mean for a while, but, um, a lot recently where, um, like, for example, on I think Wednesday night at like 1030, we got information that uh, before the second round of the draft, assistants were going to be the interview, uh, be uh, able to interview, uh, you know, when a lot of stuff was going on, the Bruins, the draft, all this stuff. And all of a sudden we just got assistant coaches and there was some loophole that they found where it's like, oh, we can yeah. do it again right now when not a lot of people are going to care to be here or get much attention and then we don't have to make assistance available anytime soon so that that was that and then all of a sudden during the draft that night so it was friday it was this was friday night with bill all of a sudden during the middle of the second and third round we got an email saying bill belichick is going to be available tonight after the draft not his normal sunday normally we get bill on sunday the draft's over maybe ask a couple draft picks, state of the team type of thing. And the Patriots made a last minute change to make Bill available on Friday night, which um, I just think was wrong and a little um, sneaky on their part. And so, look, I, I, I didn't want to ask that question there. I wanted to ask more draft pick questions, probably, you know, of grow. But if that's the only time we're going to get Bill anytime soon, like he needed to be asked. And I'm, I'm sick of hearing on Sports Talk Radio about all this – supposition about what he's not mentioning Mac by name and these reports are out there and whatever. And I just wanted to try to get him cornered as much as possible to give us a real answer. And now look, you could parse it and you know, did he give us quote unquote real answers? I don't know, but I think in Belichick speak, I think basically what we heard was um, I still really like Mac. Of course, this happened after he didn't take a, a quarterback in the first three rounds of the draft. So he doesn't really have a choice at this point. Uh, I'll readily admit that. But I think what we heard was he still likes Mac. He's not really happy about what happened last year, but he is the incumbent starter right now, and it's his job right now. And until he loses it or Billy Zappi or somebody else wins it, that's where they are right now. Yeah, I thought it was great stuff. Uh, I, I did, you know, and I agree with you. The timing wasn't perfect, but you prefaced your questions with that and said, hey, look, this is, I know this isn't the best timing, whatever you said, but you explained why you were asking the questions when you were asking the questions. And I thought it was a, a fair preface to kind of set everything up. So um, I agree with you. We we still have some meat left on the bone, but I got to run. Uh, yeah. I think we can we can save some of this stuff for next week. We we hammered the draft today. I want to remind you that this episode of the Greg Bedard Patriots podcast with Nick Cattles brought to you by FanDuel, the exclusive wagering partner of the CLNS Media Network. You can sign up now at FanDuel.com slash Boston and claim your $200 bonus. Uh, we still have to talk about the Patriots and whether or not they move the needle in the division with this offseason. Uh, we could talk about whether or not they were aggressive enough in this draft for our liking and a whole lot more. Uh, but we gave you some good information here on the draft. We'll be back next time to uh, to answer some of those questions, and I'm sure a heck of a lot more. He's Greg. I'm Nick. Everybody be well. Uh, enjoy yourself and be healthy and safe.